<laughs> right. Well, this evening um, we have um, uh, PVZ, who is going to talk us through. Um, and some more people arriving. The interwar years or river esque first in service, and a little bit more. Something along those Something. lines, yes. <laughs> and um, so we'll just get rid of this. As you know, with Peter, once he's in the flow, he's very hard to stop. So we'll do questions at the end, ah, ah. if there's any. But what I'll do is ramble about the background of River Esk, um, a bit about the history of the people, not so, and a bit of the technology, and. The reason for doing it now is that in a few weeks' time, we're not quite sure when, but we have sent the text away, we'll, we'll have an exhibition about the engine in the museum here for the next few months. Um, I mean, it's a bit like, you know, the king had a official birthday and a real birthday. Well, we've had River Esk Gala. We've had the splendours of what it was pulling down at the Romney Hardingham Church. Um, and its real birthday actually won't be until December. And that actually gives us another excuse to ramble on and possibly bring the story right up to date with a, 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 a resume of what the engine's done in its real life. But at the moment, I'm interested in how it happened. Um, we've got Mr Greenley's idea of what this goods engine should be. And this is Mr. Greenlee's early picture because it's got piston valve cylinders and looks like his version of the valve gear uh, on the locomotive as it was conceived by him. And of course, that wasn't how it happened at all. There he is in the office at Ravengrass. He wasn't there for very long or very often. And the impact the man had for those few months that he was at Ravengrass, actually on the job, uh, quite remarkable. But ne necessarily, him being the only one who had input on River Esk, because he obviously got long background in miniature engines. This was his first little giant on its trials at Eton. Uh, sadly, with some of these pictures, these are from newspaper or magazine articles of the time, and there will be out there somewhere a real picture, a negative, a plate, and a picture. But we have to make do with these uh, not quite so good images. Again, going through this, there'll be pictures you've seen before. Uh, you can't find new stuff all the time, but I'll try and put some more extra background. This is it. Uh, the terminus <laughs> of the Eaton Railway and uh, it's obviously done some splendid romp down the line with high speed that's and a remarkable thing just pause a moment Peter well I'll just talk you the remarkable on. thing for me is that uh, with Henry Greenley you can see how we got from Little Giant through the past 10, past 20, to the 30, the Pacific. You can see when he's built River Esk, been involved in the construction, how you then make it much better. So you develop it into the Romney engines and the three-cylinder one that we had in the museum briefly. Um, it's the leap in between. To me, it's like a quantum leap. And it's an important quantum leap because it leads to, in inverted commas, everything else. And how did it happen? Well, he was bright lad. He was interested early in model locomotives and designing them. And they were either bigger ones, the real various engines running on the mainline railways reduced in style, or they were his own style of engine. And of course, he, his background then was to go into the 
publications, Models, Railways and Locomotives, the magazine that he started and continued right through from, what, 1909 till 19, sometime in the Second the First World War. Now, this particular volume in 1914 was actually quite interesting because in it you've got several images of a locomotive he designed of a 282 freight locomotive, only on two and a half inch gauge, for the German enthusiast Roland Martins. And you can see it's got a it's got a smack of an engine that we have been dealing with and will deal with, but particularly when we come up again, look at that balance weight on the main driving axle. We'll leave it at that. Greenly got an idea about how engines should look, but he's also got an idea about how they should work. Moment. We'll let Beaver Bob in. The thing that isn't mentioned in that particular edition is the final flurry of the Narragate Railways at exhibitions. We'd have them at, uh, sorry, Miniature Railways of Great Britain, 15 inch gauge railways of all sorts of places. Nancy, um, places in Britain, white, all manner of them. And they culminated with the line at Geneva, where a uh, basketball coach down below was part of the ensemble. And they all went then to Christiania, modern day Oslo, where there was an exhibition to celebrate the centenary <coughs> of the, uh, I think, the Norwegian constitution. Because until a few years previously, Norway was a associate with Sweden. I mean, a common monarchy, and they hadn't got complete independence. But they ran a splendid exhibition to celebrate that centenary in 1914. Not a good year to run something as an international thing. And there in the exhibition is a little 15-inch gauge engine. It was called Prince Olaf there. It's a class 30. And we know, of course, it ended up at Ravenclass. We'll see it in a later shot as uh, Sans Perel. There are only two shots I've ever seen. There's one um, of the uh, Locota station, in inverted commas, and this one running round the site. Um, Greenlee doesn't mention it at all. Interesting. The other interesting thing is, of course, we know the war broke out beginning of August, and uh, it was to dominate everyone's lives for the next generation. Um, well, Greeny wrote a, uh, an editorial. Um, the gist of it was, um, um, don't buy Mr. Bassett. Sorry, no, sorry. the gist of it was, don't buy these German toys. We want to make our own in England. And Mr. Bassett Lauk, who'd imported these German toys for some months and made a fortune out of it, was not impressed. And the next had a letter from him basically bleating about it. And it would seem to have been a um, a point that drew a, a curtain between them, should we say. They've been involved, carefully involved in all sorts of things from the small little engines, gauge, uh, gauge one, gauge zero, uh, right through to the 15 inch. But after that, Mr. Brasilauk and Mr. Greenlee didn't see eye to eye. <clears throat> Greenlee actually went on to get involved in the war effort. He was uh, apparently gunsight, Greenlee was his speciality. He got involved at the uh, Farnborough um, Development Centre working on modern fighter technology of the time. The interesting thing is that actually somebody who'd used the modern fighter technology of the time was a guy who'd been, uh, he'd been in the yeomanry, he was uh, at a territorial, so he got drafted pretty well as war was being declared because the territorials were all called up to uh, man the British bases and allow the British expeditionary force to cross the sea and leave our shores uh, in the hands of the amateurs in inverted commas. Um, 
this gentleman, Howie, uh, John Crash Howie, got uh, into the uh, Royal Flying Corps as an observer and uh, was shot down at some particular point. These are the Germans admiring the plane that was shot down. And the gobsmacking thing is that Howie's in the front seat. Uh, he realises that his pilot has been fatally wounded. He's got to crawl out of the front bit over this dead body and grab hold of the, uh, the column and get the thing down onto the ground, which amazingly he did. Um, and as you'll see, uh, before the event, he had hair, and after the event, he lost a lot. So it must have been a traumatic, one can't imagine what it was like for eight or 10,000 feet of descent. However, how he comes into our story, because he got in his um, back pocket enough money to buy train sets after train sets. The ultimate train set was going to be the one he ran at Stoughton Manor, his home in Huntingdonshire. And this is John Anthony, as it was then, the Class 60. Uh, actually, when he was called up, was at Eaton Hall on its trials. But we've advanced a year or two because in that period between the trials of Buck John Anthony at Eaton and uh, being shot down and all the rest of it. Meanwhile, a little engine we saw at Oslo has been shipped over the seas to Cumberland. It's just started at the beginning of August on a short section of track from Ravenglass to Munkester. Here's it's got one of the perpetrators, a Mr. Bassett Lauk, the model man, with it, two Haywood vehicles behind, and um, who knows where this adventure is going to end. Uh, they brought across from Oslo, and they just time to alter on the side of the carriages what must have been Lunar Park Express or its equivalent. Nail on uh, gold plated brass letters to say Eskdale Express. Um, the little coach that's in our museum deserves more appreciation because, in the side of it, once it got stripped off, uh, Mike Sands managed to get most of the paint off. And in the side of the coach, you can see the imprint of the screw holes where the letters were put. And um, the fascinating thing is you've got not just Estelle Express, but behind it, another series of letters, as I said, Lunar Express uh, from, sorry, Lunar Park Express from its earlier running at Geneva and in Christiania. <laughs> but we're rabbit because in that winter, uh, the loco that we've just seen earlier was transferred, it was acquired from Eaton shipped up in February 1916 to Ravenglass, where the trains are just starting operating to Worton Road on a daily service. And here it is running under its new name or original design name, Colossus. Um, the whole thing was a great adventure. And Greenlee was out of it completely. Um, I think it's quite interesting that for the next five years, he was nowhere to be seen. He was running his magazine. He was taking input from all sorts of places. And he was printing articles about his own ideas. And this is his idea for an engine that would be suitable for that Ravenglass and Estel Railway, far more suitable than these little toy miniature engines. You shelter the driver in there. And um, goodness only knows what it would have been like. Um, you know. Uh, Friends at the Whistle Stop Valley have got articulated engines, but whether this would actually have had all the traction, being as it's losing part of the weight onto the back end, I don't know. Anyway, but as I say, this is Greenlee's original idea of what you could run the trains at Ravenglass with. Meanwhile, of course, the engines that he was he designed, but not for hammering along up 140 gradients and hammering down them, trying to stop. Um, 
they weren't doing quite as well as everybody at Ravengrass might have hoped. When they initiated the idea, they'd come from experience at the Rill Miniature Railway, where engines of a similar size to this galloped round a level one mile track and had no maintenance problems, no accident, and put them in the different environment of Estelle. Here we've got Sanspirel somewhere about 1917 at Boot, the very brief period when the railway was extended to the full distance of the old three foot line. And you can see alongside the engine, we've got the main passenger track on our left and the track to take ore out of the mines at the top, which leads an interesting situation that how on earth did they get there? Was it, um, why did they get, was it sponsored? Because at this point, the mines were under government control. And although there might not have been a very good source of iron, although it was uh, possibly difficult to work because they were having to dig right underground where the pumping was required. Um, meanwhile, the Germans are knocking submarine into the, sorry, with submarine unlimited indiscriminate submarine warfare, were dropping shipping into the <coughs> bottom of the ocean. And uh, it could have been that this was part of the war effort. Anyway, our little engine San Spirel, the one that was at Christiania, come here to Ravengrass, looked a bit discrepant in the last picture, was running a regular service with its colleagues. This is a back foot. Um, the engine is looking possibly actually this is predating. It's a bit difficult to tell at different points what was going on. The engine ended up with losing frilly gree like the buffers, uh, occasionally losing bits like the running boards and the splashes and the tenders, of course, seem to end up on wagons almost at the drop of a hat. <clears throat> but somebody was maintaining them. Somebody was keeping them going. And a name comes into our uh, area, Mr. William V. Couchy. Well, I think I've said before, sadly, um, history hasn't done him any favours, but he had an interesting connection, both with the railway and, I think, with River Esk. There he is, the gentleman in the centre of the picture, plump, with his bowler hat on. He seems to have his bowler hat pretty well all the time. This is a scene at Burton Road, with the second, I think, of the uh, scooters. So the railway was being innovative in the turn of the 1918 to the early 20s in IC propulsion of the trains. They weren't hard bound by steam. Um, they had uh, several varieties of these little engines because um, they didn't necessarily last long. They didn't necessarily have brakes and uh, in fact one of the later ones ended up through the engine shed doors and the engine shed doors won I believe. Anyway this is Mr Couchy who'd been loco engineer from the back end of the war through to 1923. Um, he'd had involvement in an enlarged version, uh, say enlarged in that he's had a deeper firebox, um, the six wheel tender allowed a bit of a footwell and um, well it was basically the same machine as the six coupled version that our friend Howie had bought that had come to the railways Colossus. This is Sir Aubrey Brocklebank. The name is interesting because there was some obvious financial connection and the interesting thing is there is a drawing out there which is a eight couples version of a small engine. It's a river-esque, but it's not the river-esque as we know it. Uh, it's certainly not the river-esque, I think, that Greenlee envisaged. It has a smack of Mr. Couchy's work. There is a reference in the papers, I think the engineer of about 1919, that they were designing this engine. And uh, the other interesting reference in the same thing is they were going to turn a small engine called Katie into a, well, let's put it this way, 
instead of the Haywood boiler, it would have a loco-type boiler. That never happened either. The interesting thing is, if it had done, uh, would the railway have ever bothered producing much else? So I think of a Katie with a decent boiler could be quite a machine. Anyway, this is probably, we say that probably, Mr. Couch's 282. <clears throat> the other thing we suspect he had a hand in, and, and again, these things are suspect or think, and you know, we have an idea, you may know different, but the Haywood engines were, when they first came to Raving Glassdale, to do remarkable things like turn round in the turning space of a mini. Um, but you don't need to go round in 25 foot radius circles very often. And the end result of an engine capable of doing that, as James Waterfield uh, demonstrated beautifully when he brought his Ursula, and we saw the Haywood flexible wheelbase for the first time on a Ravenglass track uh, since 1921 or two. Because what they did with the engine, they sorted out its potential for running at or not running at speed by adjusting, taking out the articulation connections between the lead axle and the center axles and putting on basically two half, uh, well, a, a split washer equivalent bolted onto the outside of the wheels to locate them into a conventional axle situation. And this was what happened to River Earth, sorry, Muriel and uh, Ella, the six and the eight wheel version of the Haywood engines. That's, the Johnson brothers, who were heavily involved in the railway maintenance at the time, actually apparently did the job, but you see that our friend Couchy must have had a handle on it, and potentially his name was at the top of the bill. So I'll just leave it at that. But the end result was that a loco like Muriel was able to run at the sort of speeds that we now enjoy with it in its current form, River Earth. Whereas previously, when it's in its articulated go around the corner sharply version. Um, once you went over a certain speed, the vibration was something else. And uh, the legend was you didn't need a laxative. Anyway, here we have got Muriel running down the line, probably about the equivalent of just past Murthwaite Holt, heading towards Murthwaite proper, where for many years there was a passing loop, and this was to be the centre part of the railway's current developments in the 1920s. <clears throat> the idea was there was to be stone brought down the line from the quarries of Beckfoot, which had been revitalised, brought into a crushing plant as Murthwaite, and then taken further down the line. Now, the guy involved with the design work of the quarry, who'd been brought in as consultant engineer, was our friend Henry Greenlee. Um, again, I don't think he'd ever built a crushing plant. Uh, there were all sorts of things he'd never done, but he got on with it somehow. And these are the construction situations where lots of stone, literally thousands of tons of stone, were being brought down from the quarry and used to create an embankment. And then the, uh, the aggregate for the concrete constructions that now stand at, a, uh, sorry, at Merthwaite. This Beckfoot Granite Quarries Limited was the organization that was bringing the stone out. And they were, funnily enough, a, a cooperative. The, the documentation for its formation involved these two families, the Hollands and the Nortons. Now, we sadly don't know the names of all these people, but I've just been told this afternoon that in a skip, in the brown cow, only a few months ago, was a photo with the names of all these people annotated to the outside. So if you saw the photo in the brown cow, I can remember, I think we'd be delighted to pick them out. The guy with the cigarette in his mouth is clearly a Holland. He must be, I think, George, the one that blew himself up and got killed. But... As I say, two families, the Hollands and the Nortons, came from the Midlands, 
the work in the quarries at uh, Broad Oak across the river, and then we came over. And the thing was, they were sponsored by the rich man of the district, although he didn't live here, Sir Aubrey Brocklebank. Uh, Sir Aubrey was chairman of Cunard. He was into all sorts of high up things, but he had a care for the district. Uh, his family had been involved at Greenlands, living at Greenlands, just on the uh, off, the, off the main road at uh, uh, Homerook. Um, later on, uh, they bought up Erton Hall and moved there. And uh, although he wasn't resident here, uh, he miniature railways in his blood. He was here, in fact, apparently testing an engine called Immingham, uh, which I believe now is part of Chris Finken's collection. And um, this was a, a Bassett Lauk seven and a quarter machine. And um, he got seven and a quarter railway of his own. Uh, we actually think now at his Nunsmere Hall rather than at Erton Hall, as previously suspected, because there is a reference in something about the demise of that particular railway, which involved uh, soldiers at some sort of hospital situation. And Erton Hall was never uh, a First World War hospital. Nunsmere was. So anyway, Sir Aubrey sponsored the quarry business, but he also seemed to sponsor the railway to um, <clears throat> get in a position to handle the stone, including having a new locomotive built, an engine of a different order to the ones that we've seen before. This is Greenlee's version again, but the uh, difference now is it's now got Davy Paxman's patent valves and bulk gear. And the interesting thing, look at the balance weights on the main driving axle. That's the one underneath the dome. It's slightly bigger. That's the one either side. And this is conventional because there's more weight of coupling rod and connecting rod dangling on this particular axle. Anyway, more of this are new. Mr. Uh, sorry, the Paxman Company seem to have been involved for a reason that we can't actually establish. It's believed that Paxman's had made equipment for Cunard. Whatever the background, they were keenly involved with a system called length poppet valves. They fitted them to high-speed engines of all sorts of things for generating or powering. And it was their little speciality. The gang who were making things for them seemed to turn their hand to anything. Um, this is the crew at Colchester. So we're miles away from Rogenglass, um, miles away from a port that might involve a Cunard Shipping Company link. But, um, and there is no direct connection that we've been able to establish as to why. Uh, you might have thought a small local building company, the Barclays, the, any of them, would have been more suited to producing River Esk. Well, their prior experience on making things included a few traction engines, stationary steam engines, and all manner of things. And this probably has a bearing on it as well, because they could turn their hand to anything. And the interesting thing is this is a river-esque drawing copy. And there's F.A.N. And F.A. Manning, well, again, sad, we haven't even been able to establish his Christian names. Mr. Manning was the chief tractionman. And Mr. Manning must have had a devil of an input into the organisation of the, um, uh, sorry, of the production of the locomotive. They had a full set of drawings within months. They actually had uh, the contract drawn on, I think, the 21st of March, 1923. And by the time you get, there we are, April 1923, uh, drawings being churned out. Now, the interesting thing is I've observed engines being built in different places and uh, splendid engines. Um, the Northern Rocks, all of them were being built, what should we say, from people's ideas, sketches, even chalked things on the floor. 
And alongside the Japanese rocks, there was somebody set up, a retired draftsman from Vickers, who was going to draw everything. Well, they sent two engines to Japan, and he still hasn't got all the drawings finished. So to be able to do it the other way around was quite remarkable. And Mr. Couchy was the man who was signing off the drawings until actually about the 26th of May, 1923. Greenlee wasn't. Couchy put his name to all these drawings. And he must have been there supervising, approving, whatever. Greenlee wasn't. Now, obviously, there was some something going on and the Northwest Mail recorded that Mr. Greenlee had been appointed engineer. And when Mr. Couchy went and found out, uh, let's put it this way, um, the records in Q reveal all sorts of things that were going on at the same time as the River S was being made. Um, principally, there were complaints at the Railways Inspectorate at the Board of Trade in London. Mr. Couchy had got a habit of calling on them and pointing out that the railway, in fact, the pile in queue is actually dangerous working on the Estelle Railway. And he was pointing out that there were up to six trains running around at time. There was no signalling. There were no control systems. There were no brakes. They had occasional accidents. They just avoided a serious damaging one a few months earlier. And this ticket is issued on the understanding the company is not liable for any accident. So, uh, and this had been pointed out some time before. Uh, the interesting thing is it's from Woolpack Road to Ravenglass. If you know where Woolpack Road is, well, again, there isn't any record of it. We can only assume it's not at Dale Garth. It's at the end of the line past Dale Garth, which in those days was at the cottages. And it was possibly where the track met the road to the Woolpack. But there are in existence several stacks of tickets from Woolpack Road to somewhere, and we've no record. So if anybody's out there is interested, find out. As I say, the main terminus of the line prior to that was at Dale Garth at the cottages, and literally at the same time as Mr. Couchy was getting involved in the river-esque design business. He was also writing, I've seen this morning, his letter, uh, sorry, his note on a scratchy bit of paper to the, uh, comment, uh, what is the, the, the Commissioner of Nuisances for Bootle Rural District Council. Get yourself to the cottages. There's a blockage in the drains. The pipes aren't big enough. The stench is awful. There'll be a fever. And he was involved on the railway at all sorts of levels. The interesting thing is that the cottages actually were under the ownership then of Sir Aubrey Brocklebank. And um, <clears throat> a hangover from when his uncles had been involved in the scheme to extend the old three-foot gauge railway round where this is through the walls in the distance and the left hand, sorry, the right hand side and over the iron bridge to the mines at what we now call Guildforce. But Mr. Couchy represents himself as a mechanical engineer, has recently written letters to the Board of Trade. This is a minute sheet, which, uh, uh, it, it, what should we say? This is the summary letter of some of the things that were put there. Uh, he has interviewed the Treasury solicitors. Now, they're the government's legal department. Basically, the guy had gone to the top to moan about what he understood as dangerous working. He had got an angle. It was that the uh, railway was not supposed to be in existence, and the solicitors of the old line had been behind him to a degree. Uh, and basically... Uh, if Mr. Couch's description of the working is correct, risks are being incurred. But of course, the next thing was that um, people in government were actually quite interested in this. There's all manner of things, quite a thick file that makes fascinating reading. But the final thing is that um, somebody writes a letter, dear Baird. Now, John Baird was the Minister of Transport. 
I'm going to renew an acquaintanceship which dates back to the days of R.C. Ratcliffe. Now, that's Ratcliffe's uh, house in Eton. And the guy who was at Eton was Aubrey Brocklebank. Been at school together. Um, not because I want something done, but I would very much rather your department exercise or fail to exercise its powers under the Railways Gages Act, etc., etc. He's put money out of his pocket into keeping the railway going. They've opened a quarry on the line. He's anxious that eight years' hard work should not be thrown away by the malice of a bad man whose correspondence I enclose. Well, very sadly, it was uh, somewhat unedified. Anyway, meanwhile, those bits are being turned into a real machine. Couches signed off the drawings, and this is what Mr. Greenley must have seen on about the 6th of June on his first visit to see his engine. So it's been building damn near for two months, but actually it's gone far too far to alter either the fact that all the balance weights are the same size, or that there were heavy pistons inside the cylinders. This drawing we think is possibly a Paxman version of what the engine might have looked like. Let's say all the balance weights are the same size. And you wonder why I'm rabbiting on about that. The story will emerge. Anyway, the one thing they were absolutely competent at was building a boiler. They built boilers of all sorts for donkey's years. And this boiler, as we all know, is a steam generator. There it is. There it is with some fittings on. And it's starting to look like the river esques that we know. The interesting thing, says the regulator, uh, the one that's actually back on the engine now, lovely, just the right size. And the, underneath it, we have the fire hole door and a peculiarly greenly thing whereby there was a gearing mechanism. When you move the handle, the fire hole door popped open at you in the opposite direction. I have no idea why it was thought to be better because it ended up on both the Romney engines and then altered and the engines that were built in Germany are not altered. So our Will and Banks ended up with this. And basically when you move that handle towards the firebox, the red hot firebox door comes down and skims your knuckles. So an interesting greenly like observation. But there were obviously concerns at Ravengrass because this damn big engine they're building is going to, well, it's all right being able to sit underneath the roof, but will you be able to see down past the boiler? Will you be able, well, the only way to prove it was to prove it. So they made, <clears throat> I think it was a lino and hardboard lookalike. They stuck it on a wagon, propelled it up the line, and two fellows sat inside and worked out, yeah, actually, it's not as stupid as it looks. So you can see where you're going. Anyway, the loco gets progressively more and more completed. Um, there's the engine starting to come together, as it probably would be about the September. And this was when there were first bench trials of the machine to see actually how it was going to perform. Well, these are the results, the indicator diagrams that were taken off the cylinders. Well, don't worry about the detail, but just observe that they're not quite matching either side to side at any of them. And this indicated that something was adrift in the poppet valve gear arrangements. Um, I should have actually had something of the poppet valve bitter, but that was a bit that reasonably worked. The thing that was difficult was their patent valve gear stuck on the inside on the second axle between the frames. And if you know the engine, you'll realize that between the frames on the second axle, underneath the boiler, that's not a lot of room. <clears throat> well, the second axle had basically two eccentrics so that either side, there were drives off at the top, 
to the valves that this rock would have sorry this rod would have rocked backwards and forwards oscillated and they hung on a sort of for want of a better word another eccentric in the middle that could rotate the for want of a better word the angle of advance a bit like basically a Hackworth valve here there you can see something of the arrangements how tight it would have been um, and when I say tight how on earth you adjusted anything once you'd made it I think it was simply the fact that the rocking arms I don't think they even had a, an adjustment in the middle you were settled with what these eccentrics drove and then later on we've actually got somewhere the axle that was taken out of the machine when it was re-axled in 2012 with the little indents for the eccentrics to be placed. The, the cylinders, these were poppet valve cylinders. Mr. Lentz had an idea for poppet valves. They were trying to develop a system that could be put onto bigger mainline steam locos. And actually beyond River Esk, they sold many, many sets of valve gear. But what they actually proved with River Esk was their patent system wasn't actually the way to do it. So later on, these valves will be driven by Walshertz or Stevenson. And in fact, it wasn't such a dead dodo idea because the um, Chapelon, uh, sorry, I was going to say to start with, Nigel Gresley used the um, poppet valve, Lentz poppet valves on his P2, Cock of the North, the first one anyway. And Chapelon used them on his incredible uh, rebuilds of French locomotives. So the actual poppet valve system was enable to be steam tight, easily light driven, sorry, light, so they could be easily driven and uh, actually not involved a great deal of maintenance. Uh, the sad thing about the locomotive was look at that big lump of a piston in the middle. And Greeley had observed this when he finally came to the engine. It was too late for him to have any input and he had to, but he knew this was going to cause problems. Certainly, we get to the end of the year, and this is the gang with Henry Greenley on the right hand side and their locomotive ready pretty well to finish. It would be lovely to have some names out of this as a, I think, a Mr. King of the editor of the Romney magazine is. One of is it his grandfather? One of them, yeah. there's a Jeff Kirkwood who works with um Patrick Keith, whose pre family again, family connection, but who they are, we don't know. And it really would be lovely to try and put names to faces. And there's the engine, as we say, this is taken from some of their literature River Escape Paxman's Before Dispatch. Well, the interesting thing is um, it was a colour that was um, not particularly sparkling, described as a greyish green. So obviously their standard colour, but a white cab roof and the white RER on the center side of the tender. <laughs> they distinguished the locomotive in its first year of operation. Here it is dispatched. I'm afraid you're not going to get better pictures than this because they're in the locomotive magazine of small screened pictures and somewhere out there must be the real deal originals. But here it is arriving at Ravenglass. It was dispatched on the 12th of December and it's arrived on the 18th. It's been shunted at some point by that splendid Ford T on wheels, the crew tractor or whatever with its shed and uh, you imagine river -esque, how tall it is well you'd be sat on a seat at the chimney level of river -esque, wobbling along the track if you were driving that machine uh, anyway here it is being pulled out of the shed for its first steaming and here we are at Erton Road on we suspect its first steaming the 22nd of December 1923 Looking a bit dirty, it's probably a bit of priming with the brand new uh, boiler full of water. Henry Greenley sat in the cab looking 
one hopes reasonably happy about his machine. Uh, the front wheels aren't quite as shiny as we will see them later. And you'll observe, of course, the balance weights. Another photo on that same occasion. The brand new machines come and everybody's come to have a sniff and see what it's all about. A slightly different day. We're not quite sure of exactly when these pictures, these particular pictures are now some sankey pictures. Um, this is the loco, oh, roughly about the two mile post as it is now. Uh, posing in the sunshine on the winter's afternoon. The interesting thing about this particular picture is just look in the cap against the skyline and you can see just the edge of what was a rod across. And the loco was actually fitted with tender sandboxes so that it could work out of the way and be capable of getting out of <clears throat> trouble. Um, and that's the only linkage Sorry, that's the linkage to work both sides. And it's, I think one of the, I don't think there's another picture that actually identifies this. You can find them on the drawings. And there we are, the man in the cap. Um, the bogies, the bogies under the tender are the ones that we are familiar with from operating at Rowan Grass for over the years, but they now four springs in, not two. But they were a peculiar thing that were designed by Greenlee for the what might have been the Sand Hutton light railway developments of the 1920s. And then, as I say, just behind his head, the linkages across between the sandboxes that would have sanded the line in reverse. <clears throat> now, this is the loco in what should have been its working environment. Um, we're not absolutely sure who the man in the cab was. Uh, it's a look of a Gentleman that Dave here has identified as Dave, sorry, a Captain Simpson from Carlisle. Um, and the other interesting thing about the shot is that uh, the loco's got a pipe on the front. It would be a vacuum pipe. The engine was fitted with simple vacuum brakes. The uh, railway had fitted simple vacuum brakes, i.e., you sucked to put the brakes on to its rolling stock. But Later on, when we see the loco moving around with passenger trains, that front pipe isn't absent. Sorry, isn't there, it's absent. Another shot in the quarries, and obviously the same day as some sort of super train was being rigged to try and see what the machine was capable of. It was designed to pull 25 tons of stone down the line, and uh, here it is. I say down the line because there aren't too many up gradients in the direction of the main source of traffic. It would have taken them down to Murthwaite, where that passing loop had been in, and then pushed the wagons up behind the bank to the crushing plant. You can just see that white spot in the distance uh, behind passengers in this passenger train. And this is where we got to try and work out or admire, should we say, how they were handling the traffic. Because following uh, Mr. Couch's <clears throat> visits to His Majesty's uh, Railways Inspectors, um, the railway had sort of got its act together. There's a working timetable that is actually quite elaborate and involved the engines having um, discs on the front to indicate whether there was a clear uh, section once they come into the passing loops or whether there was another portion behind because the railway then as operated right through to 1975 was operating with trains in more than one portion running on time interval working. Here's a loop at Murthwaite at the top of the bank and you can see the height difference up to the crushing plant in the distance. Um, I remember talking to Bert Thompson, who appears on several pictures with the engine. It was kind of his for a bit, but then he'd gone away for whatever reason. I don't know whether there was a falling out or something, and came back and it was young Bob Hardy who was driving the machine, and he apparently was in tears one day from having tried to get his load up the bank 
and slithered back down again. So although the engine was eight coupled, although it had got sanders, and although this is the Raven Glass and Steel Railway and the rails are greasy, uh, greasy. There was the top of the bank, a concrete viaduct that's still there at Raven Glass, although in build and not quite as, um, what should we say, uh, elegant as it was in those days. But on the right hand side, the area where the crushers were mounted at high level, just about the window level, you'll see you, if you come to the main line railway, sorry, and pass on the main line, you can see the platforms that the crushers were mounted on. And then the wagons of stone were loaded, offloaded through the crushers. Everything worked through by gravity. And then it was graded in the circular drums that you can just see inside that mechanism and dumped into containers. The storage of the stone were then letting into wagons to go further on down the line is in the wooden timbered structure below. And this was part of what should we say, Greenley's um, uh, less than complete understanding. I think if he'd had a working knowledge of a crushing plant, things might have been different. But their intention was actually just to use gravity and not use any belt systems, buckets and conveyors and things to move the stone. It would naturally move by gravity, drop down. But the inadequacy of the storage arrangements was to bedevil this level of activity. Anyway, you can see there, engines, uh, Muriel, shunting um, about to bring out a wagon train down to Ravenglass, where they'd have been shunted into the high level gantry. There's a little engine in the bottom, uh, Sans Farrell again. And then wagons tipped, as you've seen before, into the main line wagons. River Esk would have been doing some of this, and it's uh, its design profile was to, its performance target was to bring, as I say, 25 tonnes of stone down the line, turn round and then take 150 passengers back up the line without setting fire to them. So there was the engine actually in its environment. Not too many pictures of the far side of the overbridge and opposite the engine shed of the various arrangements, but the where the wagons are was a waybridge, and that waybridge back wall is still standing as part of the railway boundary between the carriage shed and the uh, new office, sorry, storage buildings. A river esque entered into passenger service pretty well straight away. Um, there aren't many pictures of it doing quarry work. There are numerous pictures of it doing passenger work. It's difficult to know, but obviously you didn't necessarily have a photographer going out to observe the day-to-day -day bits of the railway. They'd obviously come out when the weather was nice and try and get the new engine, Jumbo they called it, operating on a passenger train. And potentially, sorry, potentially getting those pictures to be sold to the passengers. A nice one there, you can see the Loco's got tender cab doors. Uh, they disappeared at a certain point. Behind it, one of the luggage trucks with additional seats tucked in. Various, uh, both the 1923 and the original Bassett Lauk open, uh, four wheeled opens. And then right at the back, well, apart the last shot of the Haywood bogey uh, open wagon. That, Scene. <clears throat> Another shot, you can see most of the trains of the period had a luggage van on the front. There's a train coming in. We think uh, there was some comment going on. The guy leading out is talking to Bob Hardy, operating manager, and making some comment either about the load, because that's not a bad load behind the engine, or perhaps there's another one behind because of the white disc on the front. The um, System that they were operating at the time actually involved having a pilotman work from Hurton Road down to Merthwaite Loop, the core section 
of the railway. So one would imagine Mr Hardy would have got on the second portion, gone down to the loop and then transferred to a train coming up. The passengers sat in the new uh, granite wagons on the left-hand side. This, although there were pictures of it, only seems to have happened perhaps on one occasion. Anyway, there we have a, another river-esque, yes. We're, we're, we're indulging our river-esque picture. And in the background, the old Haywood sleeping car. And finally, there's quite a mixed train behind there because, again, it's two varieties of four-wheelers. But open wagons at the back with bench seats across. They can't have been, um, uh, what should we say, perfectly clean. Let's leave it at that. And finally, the engines arrive back at Ravenglass. But have a look. That front pony wheel is extremely shiny. And in the construction of the locomotive, there was an arrangement to nominally steer the front end. It was a, a Krauss truck where the bogey and the leading driving axle were linked up. Uh, so it wasn't a solid eight couples wheels. It was a bit of flexibility. But because of the side control at both ends of the railway, sorry, both ends of the engine, um, I think overindulged in side control, the um, front truck did get an immense amount of wear and there are several wheels with flanges worn that you couldn't dream of even shaving yourself with because you'd cut. Uh, they really are quite remarkable. Um, and ought to go into, um, <clears throat> um, what should we say, and not how to do it. This is Ask. Uh, sadly, you, you don't get an impression of it being perfectly clean all the time. But anyway, we, we've, we've come to a situation where the engine uh, has got the Davy Paxman valves. It's operating. It's sadly not got the... Um, uh, sorry, initially, the uh, balance weights of the same size, but apparently there was some considerable problem. It bent the front of the tender buffing beam because of <coughs> movement. But as we say, the inadequate uh, or different actions of the two cylinders meant that there were problems that the loco was prone to slipping when you were starting off. It did create a problem. It might have been acerbated. I think it was acerbated by the smoke box superheater that was involved. These were removed later, but they did survive quite a long time. And this is actually the example that was in Willem Beck. It was actually employed in the uh, German engines that came developed from Riveresque. But the thing with any superheater element is that there's steam inside it so that your capacity to immediately adjust the regulator and stop the steam flow to the cylinders when the loco slips. I mean, you've got to adopt a system that the Romney men do, which is to control it on the reverser. A river-esque reverser, although we've got no pictures of it, the plans show it was actually a combined regular, sorry, a lever and screw arrangement developed from the Hayward locos. So there were problems. And only after a few months, there was a severe problem with the valve gear. You can see the uh, second axle with its eccentrics, the rocking arms, where the position of the cylinder was. And this is what had to be done to sort the problem out very shortly after uh, starting operations. That link in the uh, adjacent to the um, the actual length, sorry, Paxman's patent valve gear has been radically beefed up. It's got what look like rubber mounts. This is what seems to be indicated from the, uh, the actual construction drawings. The sad thing is that this particular drawing has not no date on it. So we're not able to absolutely date when the problem occurred. But, um, Somebody didn't stop to find out. And the interesting thing is that about this time, Greenlee moved on. He had worked out as soon as the engine had started serving, sorry, 
started the running in static conditions as an October 1923 drawing of the side elevation with his valve gear on it. And he obviously thought that if there was to be another engine and if the railway developed, that's what one would have expected, more river esques running here, but next to be fitted with Greenlee valve gear. Greenlee didn't stop because um, he'd been headhunted by two two eccentrics. They were racing drivers. There's a John Howie at the top, uh, John Howie of the earlier pictures, and a Count Louis Browski at the bottom. Uh, he'd also got a connection with his old friend in Germany, Roland Martins. And we have got drawings in our files here of the drawings that were required to build the engines that came out of the, the German standard engine, the Krauss K3 Pacific, 3.6 Pacific, that were to be running at the Munich Transport Festival in the summer of 1925, the following year. <clears throat> it was going to be quite an affair, um, being up against opposition from the local environmentalists, because we were going to put our steam railway round a park and possibly cause pollution and disruption. So they made a cardboard cutout to pose it and take pictures to say, this is what it's going to be. It's going to look like this. It's going to be very pretty. Everybody's going to have the whale of a time. And it's a six-coupled version of an engine that we're familiar with, slightly bigger wheels, outside uh, wheels, internal uh, actual boxes on the trailing truck, but it actually got turned into reality fairly quickly. The interesting thing, we've got a full sheaf of drawings of these machines, um, but they're actually built without the drawings. They were built on pencil sketches, obviously very detailed and careful pencil sketches, but the engines were built and then the drawings followed. They were to do a tremendous job. They were going to pull 160 people in open coaches round a big site. There was a tunnel. This is at the top of a one in 50 gradient. There was no sinecure running the trains round. They were going to run as often as they could be. These are the machines that uh, eventually ended up as our Will and Beck here at Ravenglass. Um, several examples of them are operating as we speak in Germany. This was at the Munich Transport Festival's South Station. And uh, this again shows what an attraction a railway like this could have been. Now, the interesting thing is that um, Greenlee been involved. We don't know to what extent, because there's no physical record, but he visited later, this is 1930, when he visited a similar thing at Antwerp with Bassett-Lauk, the made up by this stage, and his account in one of, I think, the model railway constructor or something uh, mentioned, well, we, had a, we were wanting to do something like this in England at the British Empire exhibition. Well, the British Empire exhibition had been running the year the River Esque started October 24, and it was going to run the following year. It had had originally one big railway exhibit, the Flying Scotsman, newly off the construction line at, uh, um, at Doncaster, Nigel Gresley's magnificent machine. It was going to be in the lineup in the 1925 year of railways, centenary year of railways displays when the exhibition continued in public attention. And let's put it this way, there's a certain interest in why would you put in your contract when you were wanting Mr. Henry Greenley to make a small version of this, a powerful version of this, why would you put in your contract in June, July, to have it ready in six months? And the only logic is that Howie and Zabrowski were going to put 
our railway around the site. This is surmising, so it's as good as it's going to be. But I think it's a logic that sits there. And the original idea for these machines was upset, of course, because Drowski ends up spinning his car and the Mons are grumpy in uh, October, September 1924, and he's killed. He was the man principally behind the order for the two machines that were being built then at Davy Paxman's. Um, <clears throat> Green had been involved deeply in every aspect of their construction and design. And this time he made sure it was how he wanted. So there are all manner of things that aren't what you would have had as an immediate development from Riveresque. But behind it, there's the scale, the boiler, more or less the same, and other details affected by Greenlee. Lightweight cylinders, valve gear, sorry, um, Walshirt's valve gear, uh, side rods that were light and strong, whatever, metal consumption, construction. So there we have the engine that we would now know as Green Goddess, but then was LZ-1. And although Zabrowski had been killed, and obviously complications with whatever executor arrangements were enabled, his colleague, how he took over the projects, had the locos completed, but not in time to do anything useful for the British Empire exhibition, which actually used a railway system round its site. It was the funny never stop railway. I say funny because they'd got some sort of system where basically the end, the, the trains were driven by a screw that had varying length of thread and this mechanism would slow the tr trains down such that people could climb into them at stations and then accelerate them to move around the site. And the only miniature railway was actually a bit of an ad hoc thing, the nine and a half inch gauge that was put down with the loco Peter Pan around the children's playground. And it was done apparently at a bit of a stopgap to get things. Although stopgap or not, it had a royal visitor and uh, meanwhile, back at Ravenglass, River Esk was entering its second season. You can tell it's its second season because they painted it in a different livery. This is the sort of Elametti livery. It's got black lining around the outside, a straw insert, and then red on the inside, uh, an Elametti red. The sad thing is that we did have an example of it that did survive for many, many years. And then somebody with the best will in the world scraped it off for whatever reason. But the engine is slightly different. Look at the balance weights. See the balance weight on the driving axle, that's the one under the sandbox, is now deeper. The engine ended up with new wheels after only its first season. There it is again, going looking at that Weybridge hut of Hardy and uh, my old the man who built the house where I live, standing by the machine. <clears throat> Interesting thing there, can you see the, the cables, Bowden cables, to work the cylinder drain cocks and the drains off the vacuum ejector. So it ran around for the next few years. A different machine. Blanges are shiny. Oh, and the interesting thing here, we've got the sand hut and glass coach appearing on this short train at Erton Road. But what happened after only a few months of June 1925 was Greenlee's, well, Greenlee's own engine came to Ravenglass because there was only the Ravenglass Nestale it, to, to test it. it. It might have gone possibly to Eton, but there was nowhere else. And this crowd have come to see how it performs. How he there on the stream right of the lineup with his hat on and uh, Greenlee in the cab of the machine. It was to be, as I say, it was known at the time, apparently, as Green Goddess, it appears in the publicity, but its name on 
practical terms was LZ1. It performed like a dream, out of the box. It certainly showed up river-esque. It was able to run at well, 30 odd miles an hour. I think the idea was it, it went to sleep. They got it right this time. And then having got it here, having run it here, there was a rumour that, in fact, I, there was a letter that we had for many years, it's disappeared, sadly, uh, that Captain Howie said he tried to buy the Estelle line and would have wanted to extend it. But that was rebuffed. And it, obviously, we all now know it went down to sit at New Romney and eventually got the romney Hyden dimchurch line to its running ground with Greenlee and Howie there laying it out. Meanwhile, at Ravenglass, the following year, steam was supplanted to a degree by the petrol loco. Um, it wasn't completely out of running. This is the first port and the one that's now Quarryman in its original open top cab condition. And the old Muriel that had been flogging up and down, probably doing quite a mileage uh, on its own. But then when you actually work out when these engines were either arrived or out of service, there are gaps. And those gaps had to be filled. And the gaps would have been filled by River Esque. So there's Muriel revamped to work both quarry trains, as it had been, revamped as Urton, uh, sorry, as River Urt. So it's got a Haywoodish coupling on the front, and here it is handling stone, um, probably ballast for the station renovations at Ravenglass. But it was also quite a remarkable crowd for that. There might have been record trains behind River Escon pictures, but Muriel was capable of pulling some record trains with it. 260 odd people. Um, of course, it's only got an 082 wheel arrangement. It's a bit of an oddity. Everybody wonders about it. But it does mean those front wheels are always on the track. There's no bridging effect from having either a pony truck at the front and rear or a bogey at the front. Now, the idea of trying to revamp engines and make more of them stuck a chord because the engine River S would be sent away that winter to have new cylinders and be revived. It was going to have Walsh's valve gear fitted. It ended up at the Yorkshire Engine Company who built a boiler for that Muriel River Earth conversion. But they also had a, an angle on somebody else's patent idea, the idea of a powered tender. And this was the Holtney locomotive a design. Uh, the idea of a gentleman was that uh, you restricted the cutoff on the main engine, the normal engine, one of your existing engines, and you use the steam that you might have saved into a set of cylinders to take the adhesive weight of the tender and do something useful with it. But you'll note here that the original mainline Pulteney setup would have the cylinders on the tender near to the locomotive under the cap. Well, the River Esk ended up with that arrangement in inverted commas. This is the works drawing, sorry, the works photo in works gray at the Yorkshire Engine Company works. And uh, they managed to use up a new set of wheels, sorry, the original set of wheels of River Esk under the tender. So there you see them with a the small balance weight. Um, the odd thing is, actually, you could have quite easily doctored those cylinders, sorry, sorry doctored those wheels, increase the balance weight idea and cope with the problems that it occurred. But because the cylinders were at the rear and the front end had to be occupied by the footwell that the driver sat in, I think the engine was bedeviled by having basically two long internal steam pipes and condensation between the front and the rear engines. So River Esk never appeared to excel itself, even though it has now got that improved bulk gear. So River Earth's here leaving with another record train. River Esk got the second portion, not quite as long in the background. 
here it is running over the <coughs> uh, the points at the Estelle Green where there was a passing siding used for many years. And you can see it's here on the station at Dale Garth. Uh, three tracks uh, were there. Uh, there weren't any platform, a really odd arrangement, but never mind. And this seemed to survive for only a few years because it was done for the 1928 season. By 1931, there was some problem with the rear engine on one occasion. And it seems that Tom Jones and his colleagues blanked off the steam supply to the back end. And even though it was dragging round a dead engine, the engine actually performed much, much better. So much better that actually the rear engine in its entirety was removed from the tender, which for now, because it had a deeper footwell, had to have a couple of wooden blocks stuffed underneath. So it was a bit ad hoc, off the cuff, and it worked. And the engine ran like that for another generation. It became the icon of the railway, even though it was um, not quite as perfect as Greenlee would have expected. It was a remarkable machine. And uh, these, to me, to see the engine, its train in the old Estelle landscape before the trees took over um, is something else. What I'm going to do now is bring this thought to, to a close because we've rabbited for long enough. I'll leave the engine at the end of the 1930s when it was parked in the engine shed at Ravenglass between 1939 and 1952. This picture actually is, I believe, 1951, when it was being revived. It was taken out of service. It needed boiler work. It needed attention. And after the war, this was not capable of being dealt with. It was one of the first things that uh, the new Keswick Granite Company took over. So what we'll have, I think, if people will let me in December, is we'll have a story of River S, what it's done over those successive years after this, and uh, possibly find out a little bit of some of the adventures we've been involved in. What on earth has this guy got a load of chipboard in his tender for? Well, actually, we've also been burning uh, Lausanne in Switzerland, Lausanne pelletized sewage sludge, and we have the chemical records of the emissions from sewage sludge and pellets like this because the engine was involved in all sorts of trials to do with gas producer combustion entertainment but here we have the machine as it was conceived by henry greenley in its original lovely condition cab doors little windows in the cab and uh, I think this was its record train of 1924. So come up by the end of the month. We've probably got it together. It's not Claire's fault. It's not Dave's fault. But we're at the point where our exhibition is with the designer. And as soon as he can put the pictures and the words in the right order, it will be on the walls downstairs. And we'll keep it there until next season. So we'll be celebrating River Esk's 100th birthday in style. I'm going to shut up. <laughs> well, we'll leave that picture there and then we will have a look at the comments because you're bound not to put away with it, Peter. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we'll have to keep going. That's all right. days of it, I'm afraid. So let's have a look and see. Oh, um, Robert <laughs> says he can only see you from the eyebrows upwards. That's I don't know why he's complaining. <laughs> <laughs> And Mike, oh, listen, Mike must have meant the picture of Little Giant right at the start. Yeah. Yeah. Falterton. Falterton. Yeah. And San Pereira, Son's running plate. Yeah. Well, that's one of the better pictures. Um, <laughs> and Mike says it took him two years to do the drawings for the Milwaukee Zoo. Well, of course, uh, the Pacific there. And and it says the early screenly drawing we have at Rom of a Romney Pacific Pacific is dated the third of June nineteen twenty four. We've both Dabrowski and Howie names on it. Yeah. Well, somewhere there should be the contract 
for doing the job. And the interesting thing is there was a six month um, time scale involved for getting it finished, which as I said, leads me to throw in to the, the, the you know, why, why have a thing with a deadline if you've not got a deadline? If you haven't got a railway. If you haven't got a railway, and game, which is even better. And it, it would have had enormous kudos in the social circles. And of course, when she came to you, the, the tender was not lettered because the RH and DR did not exist even as a company, let alone as a, a starting yeah. railway. Yeah. And then Andy mentioned he's got the Greenlee article in Model Engineer with the Greenlee fire full door. And he's happy to send it to us. Did we it take is. any pictures of the one? Oh, the Simon's. The, oh, sorry, Simon. It, but it is a Bill, isn't it? Who was the... And Simon here's the editor, and Bill is a member of the association. Right. Yes. And uh, there is an interesting article in the that's, current that's edition what... of Marshland, isn't it? Brilliant. There? Yeah, which yeah. you mentioned. Yeah. yeah. And Mark Harrington asks, was the glass in the spectacle plates? Well, those... Um, what should we say? In the cab, all the time that I looked down it, there were two little hinge bosses on the back. And I'm, they were there because it had an hinged glass window that's never actually been evident. I, it doesn't twinkle at you in any picture. And it obviously disappeared the first time the boiler came off. Mm -hmm. I'm saying that. Uh, oh, Ella at Murphy. Yes. yes. Mike is Ella at Murphy. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's the idea. And um, the RH and DR had greenly steam coolers in the smoke boxes too, but they didn't last long. Well, I think that I was interested because when I first met a, no, no, it wasn't the first time, I went hanging on to the ratty crowd who'd organised Northern Rock. And River might to go to Dresden. And um, I was, you know, hangers on at a wedding, as they say, mm -hmm. superfluous, because uh, Ronnie was driving the might, and Corky was driving the, um, the rocket, and uh, the gang, the Shab Track gang, were involved because they got uh, several running round, and that caused endless entertainment. Um, and Muggins here got uh, a few pictures and then got invited on a Krauss engine. And um, that's how we go. Yeah, yeah, I'll have a go. So I spent an afternoon driving one of these damn things round the site. And it was cool. It was cold. And you never got any condensation really? on your head. Mm -hmm. So that steam dryer was hmm. doing something. I'm not saying it's as good as it could have been, but well, they kept them, and um, I think it was doing something, something effective yes. because the engine was sparkled in the little. There's a, uh, I think, without looking at the track diagram, there's a big loop that stops at different stations, and then a thing which is effectively looks like double track, spinning off for quite a long distance, and then a, a return loop at the end where the VW garage is now. And they go galloping off down there, and there's quite a gradient for coming back, I think. And um, these little engines sparkle like a certain little engine here does. You know, they're, they've got brilliant cylinders, and um, put the hot steam inside them, and they're away. Anyway. And uh, Andy's mentioning the picture of Green Goddess is standing outside Bin's garage, oh, which yes. has just been demolished. Yeah. <laughs> be flat, unfortunately, and uh, some people have gone for the tea. So oh, well, flash and Bigel, by yeah. the looks of it. Oh, poor old Bigel! I keep looking at his um, what's it called? The football bar. <laughs> <laughs> no, the Fecal bar. Oh, sorry. Yes. <laughs> did uh, I say it wrong? You did say it wrong, Peter. There'll be some editing to do. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, the honourable shall be absolutely. Yes, I have no. <laughs> no complaints about that. <laughs> no. It's called Feck Hall because we're on Feckenham Road and it had to be called the Feck Hall Barn after that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's 
Father Ted themed rather than German. I, I, I don't. I, I only hover on the side of such things as Facebook and internet, but it it, it provides a giggle every time. Excellent. Well, thank you everyone for watching, and thank you, Peter. Oh, Nigel. Uh, Who's that? Mike. Hello. Mike Decker. Bye, bye. <clears throat> and um, we will not be here in September because some of us are playing trains elsewhere. Uh, Whistle Stop Valley, where you can also see River Esque appearing along with St. Alder. I'm not going to have said that. Anyway, no one will have seen this by then. So, River, <laughs> River Esque and another Greenlee engine um, will be appearing at Whistle Stop Valley in Yorkshire on the second weekend of September. So some of us will be support, supporting the away team. So the next archive talk will be in October. And uh, Dave is racking his brains as well <laughs> that might be. Um, but um, this will be on YouTube as soon as we can. But thank you all for watching. And uh, we will see you all soon and hopefully in person at some point. So take care, everyone, and good night. <laughs>